The northeastern coast of South America is a wild land that inspired Arthur Conan Doyle to write the Lost World epic. It is Guyana, a country of rushing white water, vertical cliffs, and tropical rainforest. It is an undiscovered sportsman's paradise. The rivers and lagoons have eight times as many species of fish as the North American Mississippi. Ingo conceals jaguar, peccary, tapir, ocelot, ducks, and wild water buffalo. The natural beauty of the land is breathtaking. Kaichur Falls on the Potaro River drops 741 feet to the rocks below, three times the height of Niagara. In central Guyana, jungle gives way to savanna, broad grassy ranch lands. The annual roundup is starting at Caesar Gorinsky's 28,000 acre spread near Good Hope. And his niece, Barbara, has come in for the event. Between roundups, the cattle roam free over all the rangelands. The cows have also calved. Now comes the job of finding out which calves belong to whom. Nobody knows for sure, except the calves and their mothers. So, nature helps sort them out. The vaqueros cut out a likely looking mother, and the calf just naturally follows along. It sounds easy, but then these rangy, fleet-footed cattle don't always go where they're supposed to. That's where the vaqueros come in. These Brazilian cowboys are as good as they come. They're daredevil riders that delight in taking chances. It's a tough life. This roundup crew goes from ranch to ranch, sorting out the cattle as they go. The average day begins at 3 a.m., that's in the morning, and goes till sundown. It's all day in the saddle and weeks on the trail. Each vaquero carries his bed and board behind his saddle. His bed is a hammock swung under the stars, and his board, a sack of meal and sun-dried beef plus whatever else he can pick up along the way. The vaquero has two things going for him, his riata and his horse. The riata is a braided leather lariat for subduing fractious steers. It throws straight and quick and is incredibly strong. It's a good thing it is, too. Caesar describes his cattle as being a cross between a brahmin, longhorn, and alligator, with a little jaguar thrown in. All in all, a mean combination. The vaquero's horse is another thing. They're small, but can go all day and usually do. Like the northern quarter horse, they reach full speed in two jumps and can switch direction at a full gallop. One vaquero said he could turn on a dime and leave a peso change. Another said his pony won a prize for dancing on eggs at a local fiesta. Well, maybe. Dogging calves for branding or ear tabbing takes a new twist down here. Youngsters get their initiation by sneaking up to the calf from behind. Then a quick twist of the tail puts the calf down to stay. The more experienced vaqueros do the whole thing at a dead gallop. When a steer decides to head for the hills on his own, the chase begins. The steer doesn't really have a chance. One vaquero boxes him in. The other leans out of his saddle, grabs a handful of tail, and bam, another surprise steer heads back for the herd. After the calves are branded and turned back onto the range, best beef is sent to market. Caesar and his neighbor discuss the coming year and how to get more out of the range. It now takes 50 acres to raise one steer, a poor yield. Maybe fertilizer or a better strain of grass would help. Guyana is a fascinating land, full of surprises. Flowers are everywhere, and so are oranges, grapefruit, lemons, mangoes, tangerines. 
and all there for the picking. But it's fur fowl, game, and fish that make Guyana a sportsman's dream. And here to try his luck is Dick Wilson, Shakespeare Company's archery manager. Bob Hack, a local sportsman and guide, introduces Dick to his good friend Caesar. Dick would like to take a trophy bull buffalo and the largest freshwater fish, the Arapaima, with his bow. The first step in hunting is to scout the territory, the savannah. During the rainy season, thousands of acres are underwater, and the animal life takes to the high ground. In the dry season, the animals follow the receding waters and group up around the rivers and ponds. It's a rough ride. Horses would be best, but for covering long distances, the sturdy Land Rover is ideal. On the off chance that a stray buffalo might be found, Dick has brought along his bow. Bob backs him up with a semi-automatic shotgun loaded with rifled slugs. Jaguar are also a possibility, although most of them have been driven back to heavier cover by the ranchers. Field glasses show only one thing, a herd of wild horses. Well, why not have some fun? Hit the horseless carriage against the real thing. have the clear advantage. Their flying feet pick a path that's impossible to follow. These magnificent animals will provide the vaqueros with replacement mounts for the next roundup. One of the oddities of the savanna is the giant termite hills. These industrious insects are the original high-rise apartment builders. One giant hill will house tens of thousands. And when the towering structure has baked a while in the savanna sun, its hard shell quickly dulls the toughest steel. The local anteater is the only animal strong enough to rip it apart for the meal waiting inside. Before going after the buffalo, Dick instructs Bob in the shaft sighting hunting method he has devised. With the body almost sideways to the target, the bow should rest in the V made by the thumb and index finger. The other three point toward the target. Next, the bowstring is taken in the hooked fingers of the right hand. With the bow at an angle and the left arm straight, the string is drawn to the face so the right index finger touches the bottom of the nose and the thumb circles the jawbone. The elbow should be high, like rifle shooting. In this position, the first two-thirds of the arrow should be aimed right on the target. The string is released by simply relaxing the finger grip and letting the string roll out of the fingers. Bob knocks a rifled fiberglass target arrow, bow cocked and lightly held. Fingers toward target. Right fingers hooked around bow string. Elbow up. Not bad for 10 minutes practice. An aerial look-see helps spot the wild buffalo herd. Buffalo love the water and never wander far from it. plane is handy for getting close. Mangrove swamps line the rivers, making a stalk from that direction impossible. Water buffalo were brought to Guyana from India in the 17th century to work the rice fields. Some were taken to the interior and turned loose when the rice failed. Even the jaguar gives these unpredictable beasts a wide berth. They have no natural enemies, only the hunter. These fellows are brothers of the African Cape Buffalo, considered the most dangerous of all big game. They have excellent hearing, smell, and sight. 
even though they are colorblind to Dick's camouflage red outfit. There seem to be several bulls, but they'll have to take a closer look to make sure, and to get Dick within 30 yards for a sure shot. After getting downwind of the wary beasts, Dick and Bob start working through the dense river foliage toward the buffalo. A big bull will weigh as much as 3,000 pounds, a formidable foe. A friend of Bob's once shot a bull so big, it took two men just to carry the head and horns. Dick would like to get as close as safety permits. Then send one of his rifled fiberglass broadhead hunting arrows angling through the chest cavity. This will collapse the lungs and bring the animal down. A careful look at close range reveals many cows and calves, but few big bulls. Still, one of these could make a fine trophy. Dick knocks an arrow ready for the kill. But Dick and Bob cast a veto. The bulls are too small. Still, the hunt isn't a total loss. The stalk worked without spooking the buff, and Dick got well within bow range. Another day, another time, and the trophy buffalo he's looking for will come walking out of the bush. All in all, a good day. Good enough for a small celebration. Deanna Country's former name means land of water, and water means ducks. Almost every savanna pond supports a flock of wild muscovies. These tree nesting sons of the mandarin duck were domesticated in pre-Columbian times and taken round the world. Tens of thousands of these giant ducks live on the ponds and rivers of Guyana. They look an easy target, but like all ducks, once in the air, they prove a swift target for the bowmen. Caesar shows his guests how a duck dinner begins by bagging a quick double on a Pira Creek south of his ranch. The wild muscovy is not heavily hunted. All the hunter has to do is crouch on the creek bank and fire away as the ducks wing down the creek in search of food. Duck hunting on Pira Creek does present unusual problems. One is how to retrieve the ducks. The waters are infested with the voracious piranha, the meat-eating scavenger fish common to most South American waters. But Bob's desire for duck dinner overcomes his worry about piranha. Actually, piranha are very shy fish. Anything as big as Bob sends them running. And yet, they have been known to attack and devour wading cattle. But the shooting is too good to fret over a few sharp-toothed fish. Once more, Rover splashes in to dutifully retrieve the kill. The piranha must be busy somewhere else today. Now that Bob's had his exercise, he's looking forward to a brace of roast duck. And he's going to get his wish. Average weight for these muscovies is eight pounds. The biggest tips the scale at a fat 12 with a wing spread of four feet. It's no mistake that these great black ducks glossed with green were domesticated the world over. They make a savory dish hot from the oven. Dick is hot on the trail of a sport everyone can enjoy, fishing. He quickly teaches Barb how to hold the rod and pick up the line with the forefinger. He shows her how to free the line from the spinning reel by opening the bail and to cast by lobbing the spoon directly at the spot she wants it to hit. Barb's never seen a Shakespeare spinning reel before, but makes a perfect cast the first time. The backcountry wonder rod is well suited for the vine-covered tropics, where clear casting room can be a problem. A short rod with powerful action is a good combination especially when the next catch could either be a five-pound fighting Lukunani or a 30-pound catfish. Barb masters the left-handed retrieve with no problems. Of course, she has no bad casting habits to break. 
Dick sets the drag just below the breaking strength of the line, a simple operation, but the cause of more lost fish than any other reason. Forty miles east of Caesar's Ranch is the village of Caranambo and the wild water of the Rupununi River. The Rupununi has the whole savanna as its watershed. All the torrential creeks of the entire west central part of Guyana, from two to four degrees north of the equator, lead to the Rupununi. In the rainy season, at this spot, the Land Rover would be underwater. In the rainy season, the land belongs to the Rupununi, Illawa, and Essequibo, the mighty river that splits. Now in the dry season, the Rupununi is deceptively quiet, but still treacherous. Dick takes to the foredeck to guard against the unexpected. Not usually a safe boating practice, but more preferable than disabling or sinking a boat in the uninhabited wilds of the jungle. Sandbars come and go overnight. Undercut banks constantly make huge trees into the water to roll along unseen just below the surface. In another week, it will be almost impossible to travel by outboard boat only by Indian canoe. As it is, the outboard props often chew along in solid sand. Even when set in shallow dry position, they can feel the bottom. When the rains begin, the Rupununi will rise 15 to 20 feet in a day, with a floodplain covering hundreds of thousands of acres. The Simoni is a small tributary of the Rupununi. Farther up, where it widens into still lagoons, the giant Arapaima abounds. It is native to all the northern Amazon basin, but nowhere are these prehistoric fish more prevalent than in these quiet lagoons. The Sumoni lagoons are a natural sanctuary for birds and wild. Mangrove swamps protect the shores, so the only approach is by river. Dick is going to try to shoot an arapaima with his super Nasita bow, then play it on saltwater fishing tackle. Not a bad idea, since the average arapaima is six to seven feet long and weighs 200 plus pounds. It's never been done before, but Dick is confident. The arapaima has rarely been taken by straight bait fishing, even though they are hunter fish and should take fresh or artificial bait. No one has tried, so little is known for sure. The action begins with Lucanani, a Cretaceous cousin of the northern bass. Dick's first catch is a three pounder. The Lucanani average is from three to five pounds, with the top at seven or eight. These yellow and black fish have a false eye on their tail to fool other predators into thinking they're going the other way. Right now, Dick has them coming his way. has tied into one of the brilliant fish oddities that call the Rupununi their home. It's a tiger-striped catfish that grunts like a pig when caught. Meanwhile, Dick has lured another Lucanani with a silver spoon. These South American fighters will also take wet flies. And like the brown, brook, or rainbow trout, inhabit clear, fresh water. Imagine a fish with the strength of a smallmouth bass and the speed of a trout on a seven-pound frame. That's a Lucanani. A fighter from first to last, and acclaimed by some as the finest eating of any fish in the world. Barb puts her newfound skill to work and comes up with quick results. Again, a Lucanani. These fish will take a spoon, plug, or fly any time of the day. They make fishing fun and reward the angler with a stiff fight on the light tackle. Dick takes a strain on the stringer and prepares to boat an hour's catch. One hour at late morning on the Wilderness Simuni Lagoon is almost more than he can handle. There'll be a fish feast tonight. the honors at the motor. Dick, 
readies himself for the Arapaima battle. And it happens fast. A quick draw, release, and a hit. Now the battle is joined. Dick saw his chance and took quick advantage of it. Another might never come along. It took all his strength and that of the saltwater wonder rod to handle this fish. 50 pound test line isn't a bit too heavy for the powerful Arapaima. It loves the bottom, but will jump when it feels like it. An early settler here once saw a harpooned Arapaima jump into and sink two Indian canoes in succession then took off with harpoon and line trailing from its back. Fishing for Arapaima is more like whaling than fishing. Six or seven feet may be average, but some have been reported up to 12 feet and 800 or 900 pounds. An Arapaima of this size is fantastically powerful. Its broad tail can destroy a wooden boat and snap off strafes that happen to get looped in the line. Dick's arrow has done its job well. The combination of bow power and then fighting a fiberglass fishing rod is too much for even the mighty Arapaima. The fish resembles a prehistoric creature with its sinister depressed snout and fins grouped together at its tail. Even in the wide world of fishes, it stands alone at the head of its family. It has only one relative in South America, the Aruna. Another cousin swims in the Upper Nile, and the last in Australia. Could it be that this family of fish got where they are because these continents were once joined by a land bridge? Finally, after much heavy breathing, Dick and Bob boat their fish. Out of the water, the Arapaima becomes even more unbelievable. The large olive green scales form an armor plate covering its entire body. The head and gill covers are solid bone and cartilage. Toward the tail, the scales turn more and more reddish. Arapaima is a Makusi Indian name, although they leave the fish alone because of dislike for the flesh. In the upper Amazon, it's a different story. There, the dried flesh of the Arapaima is the local equivalent of ham or bologna sausage. It's an iron ration for picnics or jungle treks. Millions of pounds are taken each year. The natives take the fish by patiently waiting for one to surface near their canoe. Sometimes they'll chase after one a friend may have seen up the river. It seems ridiculous to track a free-swimming fish, but the Arapaima will often splash around in the same spot for days giving its position away by releasing a small stream of bubbles when underwater. Barb watches as Bob and Dick try to stretch their fish out full length. Oh well, let the tail drag. This is a prize trophy any fisherman would be proud to beach, and one the natives will be glad to have for dinner. Only a handful have ever taken the Arapaima. But now the bow and arrow rod and reel combination is a new way. No records are kept for Arapaima. Maybe they will be someday, as anglers hear about the big fish of the Rupanuni. This battling brute is worthy of a place in the record books. Imagine a freshwater muscalunge or northern that weighs out at 250 pounds. Dick takes a practiced look at his fish. Tape measures are for carpenters and seamstresses. By fisherman's measure, Dick declares his fish to be a full seven feet from tip to tip and pegs the weight at 250 pounds. Just an average fish. But at the bottom of the Rupanuni lagoons, the big ones are still waiting.